Chapter 26 Marsilius of Padua and Spiritual Religion Marsilius, or Marsiglio di Mainardini, of Padua, 1290-1343, an Italian scholar and professor of philosophy who taught philosophy and was later a rector at the University of Paris, was the author of one of the more influential books of Western history, The Defensor Pacis, 1322. The Defensor Pacis, or the Defender of Peace, was an attack against the temporal power of the Church. While his attack was nominally directed against the papacy, the Church as a whole was subjected to attack. While attacked in his day by the papacy, Marsilius in reality triumphed eventually. The whole system of concordance has a Marsilian background. As for Protestantism, the influence of Marsilius has been so great that he can almost be called one of the fathers of Protestantism. Pietism was a logical consequence of his emphasis. His influence on Wycliffe, Huss and Luther warped their thinking. An English translation was made by William Marshall in 1535 to be of help to Henry VIII. Briefly, Marsilius's emphasis on the purely spiritual powers of the Church led to the isolation of the Church from all relevance to the material world, to politics, economics, the arts and sciences, and more. Except for those things concerned with the experience of pietism, the world was given over to the state. The sovereignty of Christ over every realm was broken, and the state became the new god over almost all of life. The myth since Marsilius's day has been propagated and widely held that, during the medieval era, the papacy ruled Europe ruthlessly and the church exercised vast temporal powers. The fact is that the Holy Roman Empire usually ruled the church. Some popes claimed great powers, almost none exercised them. In the bull, Unum Sanctum, 1302, the high point of papal claims is apparent, but even here the purpose is substantially to declare the freedom of the Church from the state and to set forth the Church as God's ordained Supreme Court of Appeals on earth. Historians who express their sense of dismay at Boniface VIII and his bull are less vocal about the outrage at Anagni, 1302. The French arrested the Pope because of his attacks in Clericus Laicos on the taxation of the clergy by secular princes. Both Philip IV of France and the English crown were then current offenders to raise money for their war. A month after his arrest and imprisonment, Boniface died. So much for the high point of papal power. Boniface had asserted the freedom of the Church in medieval terms, of course, and this the powers of this day found intolerable. It is important for us to understand the thesis of Defensor Pacis to appreciate Marsilius's influence. First, Marsilius grounded jurisdiction over the material world and the state in reason, rather than in revelation. The goals of the state are thus rational and rest in rational moral ends, not in revealed truth. This position transferred the state from the intellectual governance of theology to that of philosophy. In this stance, there are clear echoes of Plato's philosopher kings. Second, Marsilius viewed the state as coercive power whose function is to regulate and control strife. Supreme power is thus the nature and mark of the state. Between the rational moral view of the state and this coercive thesis, there is no real connection made other than the state as sovereign power. Marsilius sought every doctrine possible to separate the state from any moral oversight and correction by the church. Thus, the state as naked power was for him, as against the role of the church, the true salt of the earth and the preserver of society. Third, Marsilius also presented the voluntarist republican doctrine of the state, the state as neither rational nor coercive, but as defined by the will of the people. Marsilius looked to every possible justification for the stance that would detach it from the Church and Christ. 
Subsequent history gives us all three of these doctrines in action, and revolutions have adopted one or another. In each, sovereignty is located in the state, not Christ, although each of the three has a differing emphasis. In the view of the state as reason, the philosopher kings are sovereign. In the coercive state, the strongest are. In the republican view, sovereign power belongs to the whole people. John of Paris carried this logic a step further. He asserted the autonomy of nature and morality from grace and religion. He held that man through natural reason can attain true morality and, quote, the acquired moral virtues can be perfect without the theological virtues, nor are they perfected by them except by an accidental perfection, end quote. It follows, therefore, that, quote, even without Christ as ruler, there is the true and perfect justice which is required for the state, since the state is ordered to living in accordance with acquired moral virtue, to which it is accidental that it be perfected by any further virtues. End quote. Not only the Church, but Christ was made irrelevant to the good society and virtue. Marsilius had no distrust of either the natural virtues of the people nor of the coercive powers of the state in the hands of philosopher kings. He was not only an heir of the Greeks, both Plato and Aristotle, but also a type of the academician or professor whose utopia on paper has little relation to historical reality. While technically Defensor Pacus is not related to the utopian writings of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, Marsilius was very much their spiritual father, or at least one of them. As Goerth noted, quote, Marsilius's conception of political power is monistic, unilinear and ultimately unlimited, end quote. Hobbesian and Rousseauian theories of sovereignty come from Marsilius. The modern separation of Christianity from politics goes back to him also. It should not surprise us thus to see that Marsilius believed in an inclination to hereditary morality, a morality which was a genetic part of class status. Moreover, Marsilius was also one of the fathers of antinomianism. To free the state from Christ, it was necessary to eliminate the binding nature of Christ's law, the Bible, and especially the Mosaic law. Christ, Marsilius held, gave a new evangelical law, a spiritual one. The way was thus freed for a new sovereign, the state, to require its own law to be given a mandatory status. Whatever remained of the Mosaic law, and whatever law Christ gave, had binding power only in terms of a future life not this one. According to Marsilius, quote, But there were also certain other commands in the Mosaic law which were to be observed for the status of the future world, like those relating to sacrifices or hostages or offerings for the redemption of sins, especially hidden ones, which are committed through imminent acts, and no one was compelled by pain of punishment of the present world to observe these commands. Analogous to these commands are all the counsels and commands of the new law, for Christ neither wanted nor commanded that anyone be compelled to observe them in this world, although he does give a general command that human laws be observed, but under pain or punishment to be inflicted in the other world upon transgressors. Hence the transgressor of human law most usually sins against divine law, although not conversely. End quote. To illustrate what this means, it is far more grievous before God if we practice abortion when the state forbids it than when the church forbids it, because it is then a sin against the state, the sovereign power. Marsilius also gave a humanistic meaning to quote-unquote ownership or quote-unquote lordship, dominium, and thus separated it from God and gave it a material and societal meaning. When George Washington, in his farewell address, warned against the separation of morality from religion, he was speaking against the heirs of Marsilius, who had triumphed in the French Revolution, were vocal in deism, and were gaining a growing following. Today, we live in the shambles of their creating. 
It is thus imperative that the churches separate themselves from the world of Marsilius and his thinking. The, quote, spiritual, end quote, thinking of all too many churchmen smacks of Marsilius's anti-Christianity, 